Memory is not a folder that you download. Memory is a recreation. Every time that you remember something, you remember it differently. There seems to be a need to find a value at the core of the Holocaust as an experience. Otherwise, what's the point of studying it? It's an ongoing dance to get the balance between the unique and the universal. Because there's such a plethora now of productions about the Holocaust, it's real important to attend to what version of the Holocaust is being transmitted. I don't really know where to start. Is this really a story that I want to learn about in more detail? The time that my grandmother spent in Bergen-Belsen. I've been hearing these stories ever since I was a little girl, but everyone in the family has a different version of it. So it's hard to tell what's real and what's changed over time. So I decided that the only way I could really know what happened to my grandmother is to go there, to, to go to Bergen-Belsen. Grandmother came in March 1945. Yeah, so beginning, end of A couple of weeks before the camp was liberated. My grandmother was a part of this really interesting time in, in the rebuilding of Jewish life at the DP camp. But surprisingly, she didn't really talk about her time there very much. There were two kinds of, of homes that the second generation grew in. Those families that nothing was spoken and the children didn't know anything about what happened to the to the parents I, did, I grew up in a, like a very large extended family and all of them are survivors my parents were uh, troubled we've been working with a group called 3g and y and it is the grandchildren of survivors who are being trained to tell their grandparents' stories. A little short section from this book. And this book is from the voice of my grandfather. One day in 1945, word spread that the Americans were coming. The Germans... The thing that got to me was that her grandfather was um, in a concentration camp because I didn't meet anyone that family has been um, in a concentration camp. I'm the grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. I've grown up listening to these stories and I'm in this space where, where my grandmother's family died. So if I'm having difficulty with it, how realistic is it for children who read a chapter in a history book to understand it? As we lose survivors and as we lose those eyewitness testimonies that seem to impact them the most. I lived, walked beside that but when we start to lose those people, the battle of replacing those people and how to replace those people. Do we replace it with video? Do we replace it with art? Do we replace it with text? Um, how is it best to represent those voices and those stories so that history is told accurately and the kids feel connected to the curriculum? Art, I think, can transmit a much deeper layer of the human experience a layer for which sometimes even words are not enough. At a certain level, when words are not enough, comes in the music, and sometimes when the music is not enough, comes the image, and then when the image is not enough, come the words. I'm very nervous about the idea of multiple truths. Because the next step from mythologizing is falsification and distortion. Uh, I feel it as a historian that my primary responsibility is to be as faithful as I can to what actually transpired. One of the important things in order to keep our generation engaged in Holocaust remembrance and education 
is to basically universalize it and, and take those lessons and apply them to other human rights issues. I'm an African-American Southerner. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> I was born in the 1960s. You know, this is not my history. So why would I ever be attracted to this history? There are people who just don't want to hear about the Holocaust and don't want, and to those people I say, uh, you know, it's your prerogative, fine. But if you want to understand the nature of the world we've been living in for the last hundred years, you cannot ignore the Holocaust. As time goes by, the details are forgotten and that memory gets fuzzier.